All right, so guys, these are our last two topics of the unit. The first one that we are going to address is what is called percent yield. And then the second one are what are called limiting reactant calculations. Guys, in AP, we marry these two things together. Here, we're going to leave them separate. But guys, the first thing we're gonna talk about today, which is called percent yield, which you're going to find out is the cousin of percent error. Um, guys, this is actually the lab that you're going to do on, what's today, Tuesday, Thursday. So when you come in on Thursday, we'll grade this homework. It'll go on fourth quarter's grade. And then the lab that we're going to do is actually a reinforcement of the concept of percent yield. Here's the thing though, guys. Again, in AP, we draw these two together. In here, they're just gonna be separate concepts. You'll probably understand how they're related just from learning about them, but we're not gonna marry them together in here. We're gonna do one, then do the next. So guys, again, percent yield is your lab. So to get you ready for lab, we need to talk about percent yield. So guys, it goes like this. And I don't know that you need to write, actually, you don't need to write this down, but this is the big picture. Guys, we understand that when we write balanced equations, we've got reactants and we've got products. Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to answer two questions. Question number one is this. When we carry out a reaction, how much product should we create? And the, the answer to that is what is called a percent yield. So if we know how much reactant went in, we can figure out how much product came out. Then once we know how much product should come out, we can collect the product and figure out how we did. That's called percent yield. Then guys, the second thing we're gonna figure out is when does a reaction stop? We understand that when we do reactions, they don't go on forever. So the question is, when does a reaction end? And the answer has to do with what we call limiting reactants. So again, question one, how much product should we create? And question two, when does the reaction end? And we're gonna deal with these one at a time. You ready to go? All right, number one, percent yield. So guys, let's define it. Percent yield is a ratio. It is a ratio that compares the actual amount of product that a reaction creates with the amount that it should create. So guys, obviously when we talk about ratios, we're talking about fractions and the fraction looks like this. So it is the fraction of the amount that you did create, we call that the actual yield, divided by the amount that you should have created that's the theoretical yield. Now guys, don't get this confused with percent error. Percent error is different in that there's a subtraction in the numerator. In percent error, it's actual minus theoretical divided by theoretical, and that gives you the percent wrong, your error. This is the percent right. It's actual divided by theoretical, but because you don't do the subtraction, it's not the amount you got wrong, it's the amount you got right. So here then is the question, where does the actual yield come from? And guys, this comes from experimentation. So you will go into lab on Thursday, you will do an experiment and you will collect the product and you will weigh it. That will give you your actual yield. Then guys, you need to know the theoretical yield. And the theoretical yield comes from a calculation that you learned to do last time. It comes from the result of a mass mass problem. Now guys, today for homework, I will give you the actual yields. But then when we actually go do the lab, you'll, you'll figure it out, you'll weigh it, and you'll know how much you actually made. So guys, when you solve these problems, what you're gonna find out is it's a five-step process. I'm gonna give you the steps, and then we're gonna do one, and then we'll talk about limiting reactants, and then you'll have time to work on your homework. You ready to go? You okay? Yeah. Exactly, precisely, yeah. Yeah, so the percent yield is the amount you got right, the percent error is the amount you got wrong, you add them together and you get 100, yeah. Yeah, but I would suggest that the percent error equation is more complicated than this one. So if you can remember that, you can come up with the other. But yeah, in theory, you could. 
that would be an interesting approach. Um, you guys, let, okay, so the steps. So guys, they go like this. Step number one, as usual, is write a balanced equation. Hopefully by now you understand that we need balanced equations because they give us stoichiometric ratios. Now guys, this is where this gets a little different. Step number two is your starting point. In mass mass problems, we said we always start with a mass, thus the name. But guys, now we've got to be more specific. It's the mass of a reactant. And then guys, mass mass problems, your goal is also a mass. But now you've got to be more specific. And it is the, the mass of what we call the known product. It's the one that we collected, the one that we know the actual mass of. Then guys, step four is solve the mass-mass problem. And step five is use the result of that mass-mass problem as the theoretical yield in a percent yield calculation. So you know how artists Monet, Renoir, they have like periods in their, their careers. They go through their landscape period and then their impressionist period. And guys, I'm last year when I made this up, I was sort of in the middle of my animation period. I, um, I, I don't know. I was transitioning all my slides over to Keynote. Maurer was teaching me all these tricks that he knows with Keynote. I got a little carried away, but it actually works well, yeah. Oh, y yes. Although, well, so teaching in a sense is an art form, right? Maybe. Um, yeah, you wouldn't, uh, as not as a teacher. But, but no, certain no, no. Actually, it was funny as I was making up these slides, and again, Maurer was sort of showing me some tricks. He's convinced that my slides are probably the most boring teaching tool on the planet. His are all like dressed up and colorful. And for me, colorful is blue, right? That's sort of edgy for me. So no, I'm, I'm far from an artist. Keep it simple. So you guys ready to go? So this is what these look like. I'll give you a second to write it down if you'd like. And then guys, we're just going to apply these five steps to this to make sure you understand how to solve these. So question would read like this. Coming back again to our methane reaction, because we've now written it down 11 times. And by the way, Lexi, um, this is the answer to the fourth conclusion question, the one that you didn't get done. So here's the question. <clears throat> you take 15 and a half grams of methane, you light it in fire, you burn it up in all the oxygen that you need to get it all to react. That's called excess oxygen. And say you collect the water and the water weighs 32.1 grams. What's your percent yield? And guys, by the way, if you didn't turn in the lab, this is the answer to conclusion question four. Conclusion question four in the lab said, when did you do a combustion reaction? The answer is when you lit your Bunsen burner. Your Bunsen burner is a combustion reaction. You've got CH4, which is methane, which is natural gas, and it burns in oxygen and makes carbon dioxide and water. Yes, it is a tricky question, but you could have come up with it. So guys, the balanced equation looks like this. So CH4 plus a couple waters gives you carbon dioxide, or a couple oxygens, gives you carbon dioxide and a couple waters. So guys, let's remind ourselves of the steps, and then I want to show you how to keep this organized. So step number one is your starting point, but it's the mass of a reactant. Step number, well, two, really three in the, uh, three, two in the math, is your goal, and it's the mass of what we call the known product. Then you do the mass mass problem, then you solve for percent yield. So guys, here's what makes these tricky. You've got one mass here and you've got one mass here. And a lot of times people get confused about which is which. So let me offer this to you as a suggestion. 
take these masses and once you've written the balanced equation, write the masses where they belong. So for example, this is 15.5 grams of CH4. So let's write it there. Now we know the mass of the CH4. Now guys, the other mass that we've got, the 32.1 is the mass of what? So let's write it there. Now guys, if nothing else, we can understand the question. So let's make sure we're clear. So it's saying this, if we've got 15 and a half grams of methane, and if we burn it in a pant load of oxygen, all the oxygen, we call that excess, all the oxygen we need, and if we get 32.1 grams of water, how did we do? Is that really good or did we lose a lot of water? What's our percent yield? Well, guys, to do this, we need to set up the problem. So we need a starting point. Which one of these two on the left or the right will be our starting point? The one on the left because that's our reactant. So we will draw a line. Check it out. Don't look away. We'll draw a line and we will bring this down. Huh? We'll bring that down as our starting point because that is the mass of our reactant. Now guys, what will our goal be? Not 32.1 grams of water, but our goal will be what? Gr well, yes, but in the mass mass problem, guys, what we're solving for is how many grams of water? The idea here being is we know we created 32.1 grams. We want to know how many grams we should have produced, and then we'll compare the two to figure out how we did. Yeah. If you're good. Yeah, well, 5% yield would be horrible. It means you lost 95% of your, so you want big numbers. Yep. Okay, so now, guys, we've got to do this math. Judging by your scores on the homework, if you guys are being straight up in grading your homework, I don't even need to talk to you about this because you can do mass mass problems in your sleep. Holy smokes, that was loud. So starting... <laughs> oh, gosh. This is the chemistry teacher over at Timpanogos High School asking if I could email him the answers to a homework problem. Okay, so the colligative, uh, never mind. Okay, so, so guys, what we've got then is 15 grams of CH4. We convert that to moles. Carbon is 12. Hydrogen is f one times four. Then guys, we need the mole to mole ratio. CH4 is a one, water is a two. And then one mole of water weighs 18 grams. Again, I felt comfortable just clicking through that because you all apparently are good at mass mass problems. So then gang, you are more than welcome to plug the numbers, but I think you can figure out that this works out to 34.9 grams. <clears throat> So guys, what does this mean? What this means is if we start with 15 and a half grams of methane, we should get out 34.9 grams of water. That's what we should produce. But when we did the lab, did we collect 34.9 grams of water? No, we collected 32.1 grams of water. So the question is, how do we do? How close is 32.1 to 34.9? The answer to that is your percent yield. So we always start by writing down the equation. Yeah, well, theoretical, but I just shortened it. So it's the theoretical yield. So then, guys, we need our numbers. So the first number that we need is our actual yield. Check this out. You ready? What is our actual yield? How much water did we actually make? Watch it. 32.1 grams. Could it get any better? 
What goes in the denominator? How much theoretically should we have made? 34.9 grams. But guys, seriously, not tongue in cheek. I really think it's helpful for you to see where these numbers are coming from. And then you do the math and it works out to 92%. And as Josh pointed out, big numbers are good because that means you collected 92% of the water, meaning as Josh also pointed out, you lost 8% of the water. Um, depends on how good you are. But that said, guys, should any of you choose to be a chemical engineer, understand that this number determines whether or not you get to keep your job. That is really the job description of a chemical engineer. It's not reactions that are this simple, but the way this goes down is the company that you work for spends money to buy reactants and makes money by selling products. And so your job as a chemical engineer is to get this as high to 100%, as, you, as close to 100% as you can, because that means for the reactants that you're going in, which cost money, you're getting all the product out that you should, which makes your company money. So if you can't get your percent yields high enough, they're going to fire you and find a chemical engineer that can. There you have it. So guys, what do you think about percent yield? You good? All right. So now guys, kind of shifting gears mentally, now we're ready to talk about limiting reactants. So the question is this. So guys, imagine if we could do the lab that we just talked about, where we take 15 and a half grams of Bunsen burner gas, methane, and light it on fire and collect the water. Well, guys, if you can picture that, if you light that methane on fire, it's not going to burn forever. When will the fire go out? When you run out of methane, right? So, guys, what that means is methane is the limiting reactant. When the fire goes out, it's because you ran out of methane. It's not because you ran out of oxygen. So that makes oxygen the excess reactant and that makes methane the limiting reactant. So what then is a limiting reactant? The limiting reactant is the reactant that is completely consumed in the reaction. And this limits the extent to which the reaction can go on. So guys, what does this mean? Let me show you. I'm going to show you by sharing with you a reaction that is near and dear to my heart. And then we are going to figure out together when this reaction will stop. So guys, once you're done writing this stuff down, please just take a break from taking notes and let me just share this with you. And I think you'll really understand this at a surprisingly deep level. Can I go on? Anyone know? Okay. So guys, this is the equation that we are going to talk about. What kind of reaction is this? What kind of reaction is this? Synthesis because it makes one product, right? So we've got three reactants, and maybe that tricked you because up until now, maybe you were thinking it's only two reactants makes one product. It can be any number of reactants. So guys, this is a synthesis reaction, right? So what have we got here? Well, F is fluorine, W is tungsten, S is sulfur, and BI is bifmus, right? So if we take one fluorine, again, the mole to mole ratio, one to two to one to one, if we take a mole of fluorine, two moles of tungsten, one mole of sulfur reacted together, we get a mole of bismuth, yeah? No. What this actually is, guys, is the recipe for building bicycles. See, if you take one frame and two wheels and one seat and you put them all together, you get a bicycle. 
Obviously, we're missing a lot of parts, but we're going to pretend that building a bicycle is this simple, that you take a frame, two wheels, a seat, bolt them together, and you get a bike. Obviously, we're missing things like the forks and the handlebars and the stem and brakes and gears and but we're going to say for argument's sake that this is what it takes to build a bike. Now, here's the question. You go to, I don't know, a bike shop. I was going to name one, but you go to a bike shop and you're, it's, it's spring and you're like, there's a sign outside that says now hiring. And you go in and you ask for a job at a bike shop and they hire you. And you are now low man or woman on the totem pole. So you don't get to talk to customers. You don't get to sell bikes. You don't get to even tune bikes. Your job is to go in back every stinking day and build their low end cheap, somewhat disposable bikes. And so this bike shop, in an effort to make money, they don't even buy these bikes in the US, they actually buy their bike parts from China. So you walk into the back room and in the back room are these big old shipping crates that just came off the boat from China and they're full of bike parts. And these bike parts are so generic that you actually find out that the shop buys them by the pound instead of by the piece. So you go back there and there's a crate that says, it doesn't matter, thank you. And there's a crate that says 120 pounds of frames. And then there's another crate that says 100 pounds of wheels. And there's another print a box that says 50 pounds of seats. Here's my question. How many bikes can you build before you run out of parts? That's it. Say it again, Landon. It depends on how much a wheel weighs and a frame weighs and a seat weighs, right? Because when you build bicycles, it's not one pound of frame, two pounds of wheels, and one pound of seats, right? Remember all those questions I've been asking you in the labs about are these ratios mass ratios or particle ratios? That's this concept. Guys, when you build a bike, it's not by pounds, it's by parts. So as Landon said, what we need to know is how much the parts weigh. So guys, this is how much the parts weigh. We'll say that the frames weigh 20, the wheels weigh 10, and the seats weigh two. What are we going to do with those numbers? We're gonna divide. And guys, when we do that division, we find out that we've got six frames, 10 wheels, and 25 seats. Now, how many bikes can we build? Not six. Ah, because guys, now we've got another problem. Everybody looked here and said, oh yeah, we can build six bikes. But what did you forget? It takes two wheels. So what we've got to do now is divide by these coefficients, and I put in the ones for clarity. And when we divide by the coefficients, we now know that we've got a ratio of six frames to five wheels to 25 seats. And now we find out how many bikes we can build because this will limit the amount of bikes we can build to five bikes because we're going to run out of wheels first. And that makes it the limiting reactant. You get the, go ahead. These? Oh, I'd made them up. But so, but the idea is that a frame weighs, I mean, that's a heavy frame, but we're saying frames weigh 20, 20 pounds each, wheels weigh 10 pounds each, and then seats weigh two pounds each. So, but guys, and I, I know that this is where Landon's brain is going. Obviously, we're not going to do this with bikes. We're going to do this with molecules and atoms, right? So guys, look at the important principles. So the first thing Landon pointed out is that we've got to know how much these weigh. So what we've got to do is we've got to account for their different masses. Then after that, we had to account for the stoichiometric ratio because these do not react together, bolt together in a one to one to one ratio because there's twice as many wheels needed as the other parts. So guys, we're going to take these same ideas, accounting for mass and accounting for the ratios, and we're going to apply it to chemical reactions. Here's how we do it, and you want to write this down. So guys, when we calculate limiting reactants, 
The first thing that we're going to do is write a balanced equation. No surprise there. Then, guys, the first mathematical thing that we're going to do is take our masses and convert them to moles. This step accounts for their different masses. I want to say that differently. Accounts for... differing masses. Oh, I'm going to make it blue. Okay, maybe I can't. Where's my call? Oh, there we go. <laughs> See, I told you, blue is racy for me. So guys, Doing that, converting mass to moles, accounts for their differing masses. In the same way that the seats and the frames and the wheels don't weigh the same, neither do any of these atoms. And we've got to account for that. Then, guys, from there, what we will do is divide by the coefficients. Just like we did in the bicycle problem, we divide by the coefficients because that then tells us the ratios that they react in. And then from that, the smallest number identifies the limiting reactant. Did you guys like the bicycle analogy? Made that up myself. Uh, see, Mason, that's an example. Teaching is an art. It has nothing to do with the words on the board. It's communicating concepts. And the best way to communicate concepts is relate it to cycling. Just as a general rule. All right, so guys, we're going to apply this process now not to bicycles, but to a chemical reaction. So it reads like this. You've got 25 grams of hydrochloric acid, 25 grams of zinc. Have you noticed that the reactions that we look at are very redundant? We look a lot at burning methane and we look a lot at zinc and hydrochloric acid because they're reactions that you know. The point isn't to expose you to new reactions. The point is to expose you to new ideas. So the question is this. When they react together, just like they did in the fourth reaction in your lab, what are you going to run out of first? The zinc or the hydrochloric acid? When will the bubbling stop? Why will the bubbling stop? Will you run out of zinc or will you run out of hydrochloric acid? You don't know. Because guys, first of all, you've got equal masses of each. But even in addition to that, we don't know which one is going to run out of first. And it may not be the same answer that you had in lab. I'll just tell you right now, when we did this in lab, zinc was the limiting reactant. You had so much hydrochloric acid in there that if you'd let it go long enough, you would have run out of zinc. But that's not necessarily the case here. So let's find out. So what do we do first? Well, we need a balanced equation. Did I animate this one too? Oh, I hope so. If I didn't, I'm gonna. I doubt if I did. So, guys, I would encourage you to solve these the way I do. Um, here's the hazard, though. You're going to think this is an empirical formula problem, but we'll talk about it as we go. But, guys, now that we have a balanced equation, we need to convert grams to moles. So we've got 25 grams of HCl and 25 grams of zinc. And you'll notice I like to do these one above the other, similar to the empirical formula problems. It makes sense in my brain because the first thing we're going to do is convert to moles. The hazard in doing this is the next thing that you're going to want to do is divide by the smallest numbers, 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 numbers,
numbers 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 num